On this video, we talk about grieving our losses and also saying goodbye to grieving itself. Stay tuned. Welcome to The New Love Addiction. I'm Alan Robarge, a relationship coach and a psychotherapist. Let's talk about grief and grieving and uh, what it means uh, to consciously participate in the reality of loss. And I'm assuming if you're watching this video and even if in fact you are aware of your own humanity as a human being, it is not surprising at all to acknowledge grief and loss. Um, everyone is working with many levels and many layers of loss. And some of this is concrete, uh, identifiable experiences, people, relationships, things, places that we have lost, that uh, there has been a significant ending. There are also other more subtle uh, covert losses that we cannot quite put our finger on a specific day and time or event or something that happened, but we look back in our life and we realize that we have outgrown uh, a certain way of relating. We have outgrown a way of orienting to, the wor to this world. Uh, maybe we have outgrown a whole group of friends. Uh, we've outgrown a community and uh, we've moved on in many respects. And some of our losses are very consciously chosen that we want to say goodbye to certain things. Other losses are a result of circumstance and as many of us know, hit us by surprise. Uh, there can be a, a quite devastating or shocking feeling that when you experience a loss that is unexpected, uh, that that grief, that experience of grief is crushing and that the experience of working with that grief, working with the emotions, uh, feeling the feelings, creating meaning out of the loss, making sense of the loss, uh, being able to take care of yourself and the uh, body processes. Grieving is a very, a full body experience where you will notice it in your nervous system uh, with regards to anxiety and pain and feeling tired and or feeling hungry or not feeling hungry. Uh, the inability to think clearly, your cognitions are um, impacted. Uh, sometimes you have speedy mind and you can't concentrate. Other times you're very lethargic and it's hard to focus on anything at all. So grief and loss is pervasive. It is what we know as human beings. Uh, we come into this world and uh, in a very short period of time, we are already challenged with life experience that does not go our way or that just when we think that we have mastered something, it shifts and changes and we are in yet again another transition. And so this means that we have a, a pervasive disappointment, a unsatisfactoriness to life that comes with the experience of living. Of course there's joy, of course there's happiness, and of course there's moments of triumph and celebration. And at the same time, we can be conscious of the impermanence of it all. And it is due to this impermanence that we consciously acknowledge uh, that loss occurs, loss is inevitable. And so therefore grieving is normal. It is normal to grieve. It is a standard common practice. It's something that we do on a regular basis because the losses that impact our life um, happen on a regular basis. So many of us know about uh, loss uh, of a friendship, loss of someone who has died, a family member has passed away, uh, relationships end and we experience grief and loss. We also experience grief and loss uh, in many areas such as uh, home, we choose to move or uh, if we have some um, unfortunate experience happen. Let's say that your house uh, catches on fire and burns down and now you're moving, you're saying goodbye to that house. We say goodbye to pets who we love and we have relationships with our animals in our lives. 
We also say goodbye to dreams and aspirations, who we thought we would be and realize that we are not going to have that version of our self materialize or very specific uh, dreams and aspirations of things that we thought we would do one day. And at one, at, at some point we, we wake up and we realize that door is closed, that we are not going to live out that particular dream uh, that we have held on to for so long. We grieve and say goodbye to our body and our health. As we get over, older, we lose uh, certain mobility, we, we lose certain aspects of our health, and that changes how we orient to being in the world, that changes how we experience our body. And for some of us, we enter pain, living with chronic pain, living with a certain level of discomfort. And so all of these losses together means that we are invited to consciously participate in a grief process. Grieving includes not only the sadness and the difficult emotions, it includes identifying the resources and the strength and having the wherewithal to relate to the losses, to be able to participate on a level of consciousness, to make meaning of, well, what does it mean now that I have experienced this loss, now that I'm no longer going to have this particular friend in my life, now that I'm no longer going to uh, be working at this particular job. Uh, things move on, the seasons change, whether we like it or not. And oftentimes when we don't like it and we have a bit of protest, we have a bit of a temper tantrum, sometimes we get depressed and we just shut down and we cannot accept the reality. We're just not quite ready to move on uh, beyond how uh, things used to be. We want them to be the same and they're not the same. And so the process of grieving is that very intricate uh, grappling, the very intricate struggle between accepting reality as it is and how I want to hang on to and keep reality the same way. Let me share with you grief and grieving or an awareness of working with grief, growing up with grief, um, having a, a reoccurring sadness, a deep sadness that comes with attachment injuries and attachment traumas and more specifically around dysfunctional families and dysfunctional family relating. So let's assume that if you are someone who uh, has a history, you came from a family where there is some uh, dysfunctional relating uh, in your family and your emotional needs are not getting met. And so in fact, you might have had some reoccurring chronic experience of being ignored, being misunderstood. Uh, it could also include being neglected, emotionally ne neglected, uh, betrayed in some way. And then also for uh, some people experiencing abuse, feeling abused uh, and or being abused and the, the aftermath of that experience and making sense of what is lost in the, uh, in, by, by having lived in that family environment. So let's be more specific. Imagine you're in a family where there's tension between the parents and the parents are essentially um, in crisis, they could be arguing, they could be fighting, they could be giving each other the silent treatment. It could be a home where uh, family members, including you, are walking on eggshells. There's this sense of tension and heightened urgency around how is everyone getting along and when will the other shoe drop? When will someone get bent out of shape and feel angry or uh, hurt or dismissed? And when we live in an environment, again, let's assume that, that there's a, a ongoing chronic tension in the family and uh, in this scenario, let's say between the parents, that their relationship, they're not, things are not going well for the parents and how they're relating and there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of distress and the other family members, the children growing up in this environment, 
will be exchanging or experience a kind of chronic loss, a chronic grief. There is a uh, inherent sadness when the other people in your family are sad. There is an inherent sadness and it's, it's our empathy, our, our altruism, that we want other people in the family to be okay. And if other people, if mom and dad are fighting, if mom and dad have distress and tension between them, if mom and dad have uh, this ongoing chronic struggle to relate in a secure way, this is going to have a ripple out effect that the, that the, the family system, everyone in the family, is going to experience a kind of loss that, that we have an awareness of a uh, undercurrent of sadness that is flowing through the family and living among us because mom and dad are not happy, mom and dad are not getting along, mom and dad are struggling. And of course we want them to feel safe, we want them to feel um, okay with each other, and that when they feel okay, then we will also feel okay, because it's setting the tone in the family. So let's imagine this doesn't happen, that there's not a resolution, and that uh, we are, in fact, growing up uh, year one, year two, year three, whatever it is, year seven, year nine, year 14, that if we live in this environment long enough, we're essentially living in a world defined by grief and loss. And that if, mother, if mom is chronically disappointed and saddened and cannot resolve uh, to make the relationship better, and if dad is chronically saddened and cannot resolve uh, the tension between uh, him and uh, the mom uh, to make things better, there is this chronic ongoing sadness that everyone in the family, conscious or not, is going to be working with, exchanging with, experiencing. And so that our, our mind, we're growing up, we are steeped, we are living in an environment of loss. We are living in a world of loss. We are repeatedly and continually orienting to frustration and disappointment and needs not getting met, people not talking clearly, people not getting reassurance from each other. And if this occurs, if this happens uh, for, for a uh, ongoing period of time, it means that our normal, what you consider your norm, what feels normal is to live in a world where loss, tension, and disappointment are the constant, that those are constant. And because they're constant, uh, that is our norm. Uh, it becomes normal. And we could even say then the word familiar uh, defined as of the family. This experience is so familiar, meaning it's, it's of the family, it's coming from the family. I know this so well. This is, just, this is just the world that I live in. I'm living in a world of grief and loss. Now, oftentimes, if the family is dysfunctional, that means that they're not being conscious and open and direct about improving this unhealthy relating that's occurring. And even if they have consciousness that they would want to improve, they want everyone to be happy, they want things to go well, they just quite frankly don't have the skill to create the necessary changes so that they release themselves from this struggle. And because it is rooted in a dysfunctional relating, ultimately what this means is that the family members are unconscious to this level of loss. And, and to repeat, because it's the norm, this is normal, there's not that much effort or energy or attention given to changing the dynamic. We might be able to acknowledge we need change, we know it's hurtful, we know many family members are hurting, 
but we don't have the ability to undo the gridlock or figure out the uh, way that we're going to change the system. And so we simultaneously must reinforce that this is normal. We must endure. We must pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and be strong. And this is just the way it is. So there is an invitation to be somewhat unconscious about this. There's an invitation to uh, deny or be dismissive or to minimize the impact that living in this stress and tension and chronic disappointment is having on everyone. We just minimize it and say, well, it's, it's somewhat, we'll get through this. We, we somehow will just keep moving on and we will tell ourselves that we will evolve one day out of this and everything will be okay. Well, the part that I'm sharing and the purpose of this video is that as we continue to grow into our, our, our adulthood, we realize that everything is not okay. That in fact, we have been trained to live in a world of grief and loss. And so some of us, this will cross over into, this will cross the line into living in chronic sadness or living in a deep sadness that becomes so integrated and ingrained into our personality, we could say that we're depressed. We're, we're living with an active depression and it's so much folded into our personality so that the way that we orient is, is from a depressed point of view or a depressed state of mind. So we could explain this as I just have uh, from the framework of depression, but I wanna use the same idea and just focus on it as a framework of grief so that in fact, I become the grief. I orient to the grief. I orient to the, my world through the lens and through the perspective of this chronic disappointment and this loss that I'm experiencing that has not been integrated, that has not resolved itself, that has not uh, come to light to be explained clearly on why did that happen. Instead, we continually, it folds itself into our personality, it folds itself into our outlook on life, and in a way we become the grief that we are just orienting to the world through this experience of grieving so that in fact our world itself is a grief world. We are living in disappointment. We are living in this chronic loss. Now, this is challenging because simultaneously there is a um, universal reality that is, I'm going to use the exact same words that I've used and describe it as an existential truth in that we know everything is impermanent. We know that loss is all around us and that we could say logically that we are in some capacity, in some way, always going through a grief process. However, what I want to do is make the distinction between this universal existential grieving and loss of the reality of impermanence, but also make the distinction of your personal experience of having grown up in a family where there is this ongoing chronic tension and loss and struggle in relating in relationship where family members are not getting along. So we're going to use the same language and it's going to be somewhat of the same idea. We're talking about states of mind and we're talking about, well, how do we, how do we work with grief? And when we are connecting to the universal impersonal reality that everything's impermanent and that we are constantly losing, there's a kind of spaciousness and exhaling into that reality. It's not terribly sad. It's sort of just an honest, an honest, um, I don't mean it like this, but the, the word, the, these words fit here. It's an honest slap in the face. You know, reality slaps you in the face and says, well, wake up as a human being, you're gonna lose on a regular basis. 
things come and go and come and go and seasons change. And it's because of this experience of impermanence that you will be experiencing some grief in your life. So that piece I want to call the existential, universal, the impersonal experience of this ongoing grief in our life. But I also want to make the distinction that if you do come from a family where grief and loss and tension and attachment trauma were very much informing and enfolding into your development as a child throughout the years, that you have also a rather personal outlook on life. You have a personal experience of grief that creates your orientation of, of seeing the world through the lens and through the perspective of grief. And this is what I call a realm. We're living in the realm. We're living in the grief realm. Now, here's the good news. This is why I'm sharing this video. We think the realm is real and true and absolute. The point of this video and the point of doing grief work and healing work and what I'm sharing here is, is, is a bit sophisticated in thinking because we're going into meta, meta thinking, thinking about thinking. And in this, what I'm presenting is meta grieving, grieving the grieving. And this grief world that I am so used to orienting and living in, in fact, is not the only way to show up and to be in this world. And for me personally, I can, can explain, I can use myself as an example, is that I spent many, many years in this state of chronic loneliness. And I spelt, spent many years um, feeling the crushing intensity of a grief that was with me on a regular basis and it uh, it showed up mostly around relationships and relating and when relationships weren't going well or in fact I did not have any relationships in my life as far as a, a potential partner or a romantic partner and that when I was in this place there's something um, hauntingly familiar about childhood and experiencing a, a loneliness, a personal loneliness. Again, it's not the universal uh, existential loneliness and, and grief that we're talking about. It's this very personal orientation to realize, well, I've inherited this point of view, this realm, this experience where I'm living in this realm and that in, in many ways, how I take in information and how I communicate back to others or orient to the world is being channeled through the language of grief, is being channeled through the mindset of grief and loss, is being channeled uh, crossing the bridge back and forth into this realm where I'm experiencing a certain level of isolation and loneliness. I want to share an idea here uh, to illuminate this. And perhaps if you have seen the movie, The Truman Show, you will know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, um, I need to explain a little bit of the storyline. Uh, the Truman Show is a um, movie about a character who as a baby is adopted by a corporation and similar to a reality show or you know it was right before reality shows took off that this movie um, had an awareness that reality shows were going to be you know becoming popular but essentially the Truman show is this child this baby whose name is Truman he is adopted and uh, has his legal guardian is the corporation who wants to create a reality show where this child will live in a fake world, a completely manufactured world. So, and everyone in the world, in this world are actors and, and where Truman is living is in fact, is a, uh, like a Hollywood uh, soundstage. It is a fake world where the walls, the, the buildings are not actual buildings. They're more makeshift sets. And so he, he's living in this world of sets. 
And the movie has a number of different components to it, but essentially over time he comes into consciousness. He cannot ignore the fact that there are breaks in this reality and he realizes that he's, that this, that what he thought he, what he thought was real is not real. And he figures out that he's actually in this fake world. So I share that information. That is a setup to describe this idea of living in a grief realm in that if you are used to coming from a family where there is this certain level of tension and struggle and disappointment due to uh, the chronic lack of resolution of, of the parents being unable uh, to work out their differences or unable to make sense of their disappointments with each other. And that in fact, you might uh, develop into living in a world where you experience your sense of normal, your sense of how you perceive the world is in referencing and keeping alive this grief that you have been marinating in, that you have been stewing in for the majority of your life so that you enter your adult years, you enter your 20s, you move into your 30s, and you are living your life through the lens of this realm. Well, what I'm proposing is that this realm is like the Truman Show. It's a makeshift world. It's a realm. It is not concrete. It is not solid. In fact, it is not the real world. It is not the bigger world. It is not the bigger reality. It is a construct of grief. It is a construct that has limitation. It is a construct that has been created out of attachment trauma and attachment distress and uh, emotional relational needs going unmet uh, emotional relational needs not being met and that we have constructed, we were trained to live in this world, in this realm of grief, and we don't challenge it and our brain continues to move into the next chapter of our life and we take with us this construct of how we are orienting to the world around us. And similar to the Truman Show, we are living in this realm, in this fake world where the walls are not real and where this is actually like a movie set. And there's a world beyond your confined experience of being stuck and solidified in grief and loss. As you can imagine, if you're still with me, if this is somewhat of a sophisticated thinking, this is meta thinking, meta processing, and we're, we're, we're really talking about meta grieving, which is grieving the grieving and looking at how we actually not only say goodbye to the object that we're losing. We don't only say goodbye to the losses of our disappointment, the things that we once had that we no longer had, the people who die, uh, the homes that we change, the uh, losing our childhood, our dreams and aspirations, all of it wrapped up. We're not only grieving and saying goodbye to the objects of the loss we begin to wake up and to expand our consciousness and realize I don't have to grieve all the time. I don't have to only orient to this level of intense loss as a given or a constant foundational way to which I'm relating to the world. In fact, I can take a break from it. In fact, this Hollywood set, the Truman Show set, the realm in which I'm living, the walls can come down. This construct can dissolve. Now, here's where I return. Here's how I reconnect and revisit to the universal, the existential reality of impermanence. I'm not saying that grief and loss is going away. Again, we tap into this universal, impersonal experience of, of loss and say, well, that's normal. 
you know, of course, you're all you're still going to experience loss. The piece that I'm suggesting is what changes is how you're relating to it and orienting to it in such a way that although we know it's personal, it's not going to feel devastatingly personal. And although it's unique to your personal experience, there's a way to put it in a context that makes sense that this is about the bigger workings, the bigger, um, uh, the bigger um, system of reality that's not linked to just my own limited system of reality that's rooted in dysfunctional relating or rooted in attachment trauma or rooted in unresolved losses in my family, my family who that have not made peace with the past, who have not been able to be conscious of how there were limitations in the interactions and the relating with family members. And this is why we grew up and why we lived in a world, in a realm of uh, grief. So when this dissolves, we're grieving, grieving. We're saying goodbye to grieving. This can be so freeing. If you even hear the words, if you can join me in this concept, if you imagine the world around, now keep in mind what I'm sharing, it's also scary. Uh, when that world starts to fall apart and when you begin to, when sunshine comes in a little more, when the, the breeze begins to blow through your world a little more, where you're, you're touched uh, by the breeze, you're touched by the air, you're, you're letting in the phrase I always use is finding ocean. And that's a metaphor, that's a nice romantic way of saying letting in the awe and the inspiration of life. So when we find ocean and we allow ourselves to connect with ocean, and this, this, this realm of grief, this grief realm starts to dissolve, and we wake up, and, and this is what's meant by an aha moment. An aha moment is where the mechanics of your brain, the, the mechanical workings of, of you know, the, the system and the order, uh, there's a cog in the wheel and something shifts and you, it just sort of opens up. There's this, this clarity, this vantage point, this completely different perspective. And that's what I'm talking about when we wake up to the fact that we are confined and it can feel like chains, it can feel like a prison, it can feel like um, I'm being held captive um, in this very, the opposite of the word spacious, it's constricting, it's rigid, it's, um, I also use the word the wasteland, wandering in the wasteland, that experience of being lonely and you're you're just, you're just wandering in the wasteland and it, it has this vastness, but at the same time, it's a kind of singular state of mind. So there's a rigidity to the thinking because it's about loss and grief and a deep sadness that does not resolve itself. And what I'm suggesting is that when you begin to realize that's not the only way to orient, you do not have to live in that realm. You do not have to live permanently on the set of The Truman Show. You do not have to live only confined uh, as a product of your family history. Um, we could also use the, the, the idea of uh, you don't have to still stay that younger child stuck in your family in that environment. We get the child out of that, we come into the present moment and we realize there's actually other ways to orient. There's other, there's, there's another world, there's another realm or realms plural that we haven't even uh, experienced. And this process of saying goodbye to saying goodbye, saying goodbye to grieving, grieving, grieving itself and say, I'm just so exhausted from this chronic grief experience that I'm living and that I realize that I'm looping in this place. And it's this idea of let's see the forest for the trees. Let's get perspective. Let's pull back. Let's see the bigger picture. And I begin to realize grieving is not the only way to orient. Again, third time I'm going to say it just to fit it in here. Grieving's not going away. So even though I realize grieving is not the only way to orient, 
as a human being, I'm still going to have moments where grief comes in. The difference is that when that grief feeling comes in, it's not going to uh, reinforce or solidify me staying stuck in this realm. Think of it as eating and think of it as food. And let's say the grief realm is eating uh, unhealthy food and eating junk food. If we change that realm, if we wake up and we, if we realize, oh, wow, there's actually farmer's markets in this world and there's fresh vegetables and there's this thing called gardening. Have you ever heard of gardening? That would change the realm. If we only thought that our orientation to food was fast food and junk food, that when we get introduced to these other ways of healthy nourishment and healthy nutrition and, and ways to cook food that are very delicious and very healthy, the realm starts to dissolve. We, we have an aha moment. We shift and we think to ourselves, wow, that's really profound. Like I used to think that, that food only meant one thing, but now it doesn't. So when this happens, we're not getting rid of being hungry. I'm still going to get hungry. That's what I mean by saying we're not getting rid of the grief. I'm still going to have grief. I'm still going to have sadness. I'm still going to experience loss in my life because as I said, that's universal and everything's impermanent. So of course, there's no surprise here. There is more loss on the horizon for you. There's more loss on the horizon for me. We don't have to get bent out of shape about that because we know that that's a universal truth. The difference is, is that when the grief comes in, it's not going to solidify and reinforce staying stuck where I'm orienting to my only way of being is to stay solidified in the rigidity of that grief realm or of that grief world. One way that we begin to grieve the grief and grieve, uh, saying goodbye to grieving itself is we try to hold in our mind this bigger perspective and that we in fact can let in other experiences of joy and happiness and contentment and that um, being in the grief realm is not the only way to be. I hope this video was helpful. It's rather sophisticated, um, complex thinking, but if you are at a place where um, you're realizing living stuck in this place is no longer working for you. In fact, it's not so much something that you do to make this happen. It's that you're courting this consciousness and this maturity, and it's being able to work on a very, very um, intimate level with the experience of your grief that you begin to realize that it does not define you. It is not only who you are. It is not the only way of being. And that other realms begin to enter. Other, other ways beyond the realm of grief um, start to present themselves. And again, as I said, that, that's what's meant by an aha moment. Uh, when your consciousness shifts, when, when your perspective changes so much, and then you realize, I don't have to live um, orienting to the world through this level of grief as I pretty much have been my entire life. Again, I hope that this is helpful. If you like this video, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. There are other videos similar to this on their way. And if you subscribe, you'll be able to uh, see those uh, once they are released and uh, uploaded. Also, if you want to learn more about me, please do at alanrobarge.com. And then finally, if you want to uh, talk about ideas such as, th as this and explore other ideas related to attachment injuries and attachment trauma, there is a Facebook group called The New Love Addiction. And I will include the URL here and you can uh, join that group. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.